Yep. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the November 14th, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with the Board Policy 8311, the chair of the committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Wash, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Present. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Ms. Hen? Present. Thank you, Ms. Hassan? Present. Thank you, Ms. Rowe? Present. We have a quorum. Ms. Pitts, please call the roll to determine the presence of staff members who are present. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Becker? Present. Mr. Dixit? Present. Dr. Grimm? Present. Thank you, Ms. Shea? Present. Thank you, Ms. Howie? Here. Ms. Wash? Here. Thank you. Our first item is policy 1300 use of school facilities. Uh, Mr. Dixit, please proceed. Uh, my name is Pete Dixit. I'm director of executive, I'm executive director for facilities management and strategic planning. So as a matter of background on the October 25th meeting, the board returned policy 1300 for further consideration. Uh, specifically, uh, the changes being asked to be looked at is on page one, line 34, adding parking lots to the definition of school facilities in section two after sites and the four building and structures, thereby allowing parking lots to be reserved for community use. Item two, including language that requires a security check of the facility before, during, and after each use. And item three on page three, line eight, adding a number six to section G, which would require that any damage resulting from use of facility be reported promptly to the Office of Facilities Operations and that all damages will be paid in full by the organization that utilize the facility. So we have some background information, cost analysis and fiscal impact on those changes if they are made. And I'll just go briefly over that. Um, the board is aware that we have more than 80,000 requests that we get for use of facilities currently, and we encourage the use of facilities. But there are implications of these changes, and we would like to share that with you. Uh, a 20% increase would generate approximately 16,000 new requests, and these are just um, approximate number. Um, the estimated cost of a single secure security check would be in our mind and our estimate ex will exceed $200 per use. And that will be in addition to the four hours block that is for the custodial services. So when we compute that number, that could be approximately six to $7 million for 16,000 um, a new user school facilities request. 
In addition to that, the second piece of information we wanted to share with the committee is that our reservation system known as event manager. Uh, parking lot, it doesn't have the capability of reserving parking lot. But when the community groups use indoor space. Parking spaces are available on a first come first serve basis. Uh, our department does not have the staffing capacity to reserve parking lot. Requests for reserving parking lot require additional staff to process the request and enforce the reservation by verifying that only authorized users are parking in approved spaces. The proposed extended facility usage as in sections 1B and 3E will result in additional stress placed on facilities and is likely to require additional maintenance, repair and capital improvements not to say of additional risk. The rate of weekend uses for school facility is challenging it as it is. I have Ms Becker of my team who's part of this meeting and um, we just want to share with the committee that uh, this type of increase that may result, it will compromise the safe and secure environment for students next day. Uh, specifically over the weekend when our resources are limited and sometimes uh, these res reserved spaces could go into late night or late afternoons. It will be very difficult for us to make sure that this space is safe and secure and clean for the next day of school operation. So we wanted to uh, share that. Um, Committee members, other questions? Ms. Kazi, did you have a question? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Ms. Rio. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you uh, for being here and thank you for this um, update. On line, page one, line uh, 26, Paragraph C states the board is further committed to the concept of joint utilization of school facilities. This has been demonstrated by sharing school facilities with the Baltimore County Department of Rec and Parks and other agencies. Um, I had asked um, today, and I just uh, understood today this policy was added, um, to have uh, staff provide the most recent memo of understanding of joint use between Rec and Parks and the Board of Education. Um, I just wanted to know if staff had a chance to um, attach that to board docs or send that to the so Ms. Posey, No, this has not been sent. It will be sent to the committee when we get it. And this policy has been on the agenda and posted since last Thursday. Uh, the only addition for today was a revision to the analysis. Uh, we realized that we had neglected um, a few phrases in our analysis that was um, our error, so we corrected it so that the committee would have the most recent analysis. But no, this is not a new addition to the agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, so the analysis that I printed out earlier, it do does not reflect um, the most recent changes. Thank you for that. Yeah. And it does reflect is, the most recent changes. It would have been posted this morning. Yes, thank you. No, I had printed out my documents last week. So, uh, uh, but oh, um, yes. in looking through the remainder of policy 1300, um, there does not seem to be any reference to the memo of understanding. Is, am I correct in that? Ms. Kazi, can you ask that question again? Yes, I did not see a reference to the memo of understanding uh, between the Department of Rec and Parks and the Board of Education in this policy. 
and it's not referenced in the policy. Is it referenced in a different policy? Not to my knowledge. OK, that's all that's for now. That's interesting that it's not referenced. Is there is there a reason for that or is it just an oversight? Well, it, the sentence uh, that Ms. Causey referenced does indicate the board's commitment to joint utilization, not by what means that joint utilization will take place. Um, I have a question for Mr. Dixit. Right now, when Rex and Parks uses our building, um, and that's usually done through the joint use, um, who ensures the security of the building as a Rec and Parks event leaves? I mean, I know there's county staff that does some of that, and I'm just wondering if, if part of our um, shared use agreement could be that a police officer walk through the building that was used by Rec and Parks or do a security check. So I do not know the availability of police officers, so I can't even handle that question. But a lot of use of by Rec and Park is, um, uh, is is a known use. The folks have been using for a long time. Uh, one of the issues that we discussed internally is that what we are doing is inviting new users that we don't have any history on, which is different than the users that have been using building in the past, which uh, which we are familiar with. Uh, with that, uh, I have Ms. Becker, if you want to add anything in response to Ms. Rowe's question. No, the, the response, any of the responsibilities of being in the building is on rec and parks. We do not have any security. And just like Pete says, we would not be able to schedule Baltimore County Police. Um, that I would think would be on, be handled through rec and park because there are, they are our county partners um, mm -hmm. that we, we just, I guess they, they they assure us at this point they handle everything inside the building when we're not there when they're using the building. Right. And so my familiarity with the way the rec councils work is that um, the rec councils are volunteer and the people mm -hmm. running the sports are volunteers, but there's rec and park staff that are there for the sake of opening and closing the building. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm just thinking that maybe we can deal with some of the security issues, at least where Rex and Parks is concerned, because I don't think it's unreasonable for parents to be assured that when people outside the school system have used the building, that the building's been walked through and is to the best of someone's ability secure. And all of our buildings have SROs and they have different responsibilities. I, I think there needs to be some negotiation with the school system and Baltimore County government to make sure that there's some cooperation after the community uses a building. If the school system approves the use, I would think that uh, county government could collaborate with us to make sure that the building is secure after that. So that point is well taken, Ms. Rowe, for the users that are part of the Baltimore County system. But the users that we are talking about adding, these are uh, users related to uh, political groups and religious groups. And some of those conversations, as we all know, can get very passionate at times and may have security ramification, ramifications that, that we do not know at this point. And uh, we are concerned. We want to bring that to your attention. It is your policy. Uh, if it is changed, we'll do everything that we can to make sure that the policy is implemented. But we, we want to make sure that there are security issues that we are concerned about and with the national climate that we see all the time and with the type of conversation that takes place in political campaigns and on in, in the religious part 
we are not sure and we just want you to know about it. Mr. Dixit, I understand what you're saying. Unfortunately, the General Assembly has thrust a fair amount of that on us. It's not like we're arbitrarily making this stuff up because we thought of it on our own. <laughs> I mean, the, but that said, we if we're going to open the schools up to the communities, we do have to make sure that they're safe for students the next morning, either by having SROs come in very early the next morning and walk through the school, or by having someone do it when the group leaves. So the kind of issues that we have in terms of vacancies and in terms of available uh, availability of workforce, it is the same issue all over, whether you talk about police department or SROs or whatever. So it is adding significant amount of work hours, regardless of who does it, and significant amount of cost. Uh, and the other piece that I think I briefly mentioned is the additional repair, maintenance, uh, and additional usage of the building itself. Uh, we have our own issue trying to maintain boilers and chillers going, for example. Uh, I understand. So, okay, and sometimes uh, we work on Saturdays and Sundays uh, in an attempt to get the boiler and chiller going to reduce the probability of failure next day on Monday or whatever the next day is. This is not going to help us. So there may be days when because the system was used, additional usage, that we, that we may get failures. And these are the concerns that we want you to hear and be aware of uh, uh, before you make the decision. Well, I the, see, it, I'm not so sure that it's actually our decision to make. I think that the General Assembly has made the decision to mandate a certain amount of school usage, and this is information that should have been given to the General Assembly when they gave us this lovely unfunded mandate. Um, I hear what you're saying, um, but there's not there's some flexibility, but not a lot of flexibility in the new statutes. Um, and I believe we already discussed where that flexibility was and wasn't and removed the things that we had flexibility about. Is that correct, Margaret Ann? You have uh, you do not have a mandate in your policy. You say you encourage the use of school facilities for these purposes, not that you require them. Right, but the areas where the General Assembly said that we have to do something. That we have, but the areas where they said that we have a choice, we have said it's optional. Right, so we have put into our policy as much flexibility as the General Assembly has given us. I Ms. don't Rowe? think. That, yeah. Oh, may is I comment? This, is this Julie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Hen. Just a brief comment. Um, it concerns me to hear staff say that we have less of a security risk with groups that we are familiar with. Um, one, that seems to be a discriminatory statement, and two, whatever security measures we do put in place um, should be put in place universally. Um, I, I don't think that should be our guiding principle by which we limit access to groups. Um, it's a familiarity bias and it certainly um, does not hold true in terms of risk management. So I just wanted to caution the committee on um, policy making based on familiarity and the security risks associated or not, you know, with one versus the other. Thank you. Sure, I understand what you're saying, um, Ms. Han. I feel the same way that we need to have security policies that apply whoever we allow to use the building. Um, but I think that if it's a county rec and parks using the building, that the county staff that are in the building can do the security checks or bring in a Baltimore County police officer to do it. I just don't know what we do with the other groups that may use the building. Um, and I think that's something that operationally the superintendent's gonna have to be concerned about because it, I'm not comfortable with the idea that different people are using our buildings and we're not doing a security check of the building before kids enter school the next day. And so I think we have to do the security check. Are there any more um, questions for committee members? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. 
Go ahead. So I uh, would just question the <clears throat> fiscal note. Um, and is that in the new policy analysis? The uh, numbers that Mr. Dixit stated earlier? Yes, it's in there. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I would just question the reality of, excuse me, 16,000 additional events uh, over and above what occurs currently, um, especially given that the vast majority are already coming through Reckon Parks. Knowing the volume of our schools with rec, with our local rec and parks, and how difficult it is just to get school facility space for all of our rec and parks events, I have a very difficult time that there's going to be thinking that there's very much vacancy left for non rec and park stuff, because rec and parks utilizes the school facilities almost to capacity. At least in at least um, with the rec council that I was on, so. I mean, obviously, we can't have multiple events going on at the same time in the same space. OK, we need to move on. If there's no amendments to this policy, are there any amendments, committee members? Madam Chair, I have an amendment and I'm Go typing ahead. it in the chat. Um, I move that policy 1300 be amended to add to page one, line 29. In order to effectively protect and coordinate use of school facilities, the board will maintain a comprehensive Memorandum of Understanding with the Baltimore County Department of Recreation and Parks. Every two years, the board will review, update, and approve the Memorandum of Understanding with the Baltimore County Department of Recreation and Parks. A review of the MOU may occur sooner, if necessary, by changes to law, recommendation of the superintendent, request by Baltimore County Department of Recreation and Parks, or request by the board or board chair. The superintendent will administer This, I'm not sure that that's quite right, but there we go. Is there a second? I'll second it, but I'd like to offer an amendment to Mrs. Causey's motion. Well, before you second it, why don't you just tell us how you want the wording to change and if she'll take it, then we can. Sure. I was just going to suggest that um, it be every three years rather than every two. Ms. Causey, is that acceptable to you? Yes, I will change it in the chat. OK, and then uh, Ms. Hen is seconding it. Are there any um, comments or questions on this motion? May I speak to my motion? Briefly, because we do have to move on. Yes, thank you. I think the safety implications of any organization using our facilities is important, especially given such tragic and unfortunate circumstances that occur. So that would be an aspect of, should be an aspect of the comprehensive memorandum of understanding uh, with the Baltimore County Department of Rec and Parks since they are the largest by far um, user of our facilities. Um, and then uh, the superintendent can certainly in the rules that in the rule that supports this policy uh, create additional uh, forms or uh, wording that would indicate whether certain groups uh, would need to have a security check afterwards, um, you know, the amount of custodian time and so forth. That's an administrative uh, detail, but I think that uh, the safety issue is, is very important um, and that it, you know, is if it's not stated in here, then we can do that in a different motion. But I think this motion is absolutely critical, uh, especially as I understand that we uh, that the current one has not been updated for some time. Is that correct? Ms. Howie, can you just um, correct me and tell me if there's just one thing? The document that we use with Baltimore County, is it called a memorandum of understanding or is it a shared a use? A use of a shared use of facilities agreement is that there's a particular name for that document 
I think that what Ms. Tazi means is that document that we already do. And I think she used memorandum of understanding, but I think that we should possibly use the name of that document. Do you recall what it is? I believe it's called the joint use agreement. OK, Ms. Kazi, do, do you understand what I'm saying? I do understand what you're saying, and I, uh, if appropriate, will update this with yeah, that I language. Think, um, so I think we should if no one objects, change memorandum of understanding to joint use agreement because um, joint use agreement for school facilities, I think is the full title um, because that's how it's Ralph? commonly referred to. Yeah, go ahead, Ralph? Julie. Yes. Yeah, I up and I just wanted to confirm that it's joint use agreement, Board of Education, Baltimore County, Baltimore County Department of Recreation and Parks. Joint use agreement. OK, so um, we'll use that language instead of memorandum of understanding. So it's not. Joint use agreement for school facilities. It's joint use agreement. Joint use agreement, as I recall. Yes, ma'am. That's the title, but it deals with school facilities. I'm correcting it. Oh, I see. Are there any objections to this amendment? Ms. Rowe, there's a question in the chat. Go ahead, Dr. Hager. Um, I don't have my notes in front of me. I, I can do a little digging, but we had that meeting with Rec and Parks a, a month or so ago, and I feel like we reviewed the joint use agreement then. Um, I, I, I don't. I guess I, I think the point of this is the is the the words that are used that say. Uh, um, sorry, effectively protect and coordinate. I think the word protect is really the the, the key to what this uh, motion is about. But since we already have one, I guess I find it a little bit confusing. Um, because go ahead. We don't have the fact that we have one anywhere in policy. It's just a thing that happens. And by okay. putting it in the policy, it's basically saying that this is no longer an optional thing for the superintendent to do if he wants to, or if school staff want to. This is a thing that the board is saying you will have and maintain this joint use agreement, but it's not creating anything new. The county and the school system have been doing this forever. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. That makes sense to me. OK, are there any objections to this amendment? Mr. Right, Rowan, I do just want to clarify, if I may, um, with Dr. Hicker, the board did not approve a. Uh, uh, um, a joint use agreement in that meeting. Yes, I, I know I, I meant we we went over it. We discussed it that it exists, I guess already is what I'm saying. Right. Yes, yes. OK, are there any objections to this amendment? No objections, just one comment, Ms. Rowe, and that is the latest one on the county's website is from 2003, just for context. Right, so having a three year time limit is good. All right, if there's no objections and I have heard none, then this amendment stands. Are there any objections to moving policy 1300 as amended use of school facilities forward to the full board for approval? Ms. Rowe, question from staff, please. Yes. Um, the policy review committee was to consider three amendments. Uh, page one, adding parking lots. Um, page including language about a security check and requiring that uh, if there's any damage that the damages would be paid in full by the organization that utilized the facility. Those were the three requests that the board had that oh, the right. committee discussed and I don't know if the committee has discussed any of those. So it hasn't, it's not in the current amended language is what you're saying. It is not because it was not okay. amended by the board. The request was that PRC discuss whether or not these amendments should be considered. All right, well, let's take those one at a time. What was the first one? The first one was to add parking lots to the definition of school facilities. OK. Um, is there a motion to add parking lots to the definition of use of school facilities? Yes, so okay. move Cosby. And I'll second that. I think the reason for that was because there had been an event where a, a 
um, religious community next to the school had an event and they really just wanted to be able to use the parking. They weren't using the actual school facility and it was very confusing to them as to how they were supposed to go about that. So um, that is what prompted that. Dr. Hager? Um, I fully support this motion. Uh, however, I know I, I joined right as Mr. Dixit was explaining reasons that it, it would be challenging. And I know that it's also in the analysis. Um, and I just I, I have trouble understanding um, if people are allowed to rent indoor space, you know, given the, the few months out of the year where the weather is nice for an outdoor activity in the parking lot or, um, you know, uh, folks who have uh, buildings adjacent to our, our buildings to be able to use the parking spaces. It, I understand um, that it would require additional support from us, but it just doesn't seem like that heavy of a lift given what a great asset it could be to the community. So I don't know if there's, um, so I, I do support this, but I, I did want to recognize that Mr. Dixit had some comments on this as well. Sure, and I think adding parking lot to the definition, I don't think that necessarily means that somebody has to reserve a parking lot and then ropes are carved out and then nobody can sit in the parking lot. I think it just means that if somebody's having an event and they want to use the parking lot, no one's going to tow their car if they do. So parking lot is always available on a first come first serve basis. When you okay. reserve a park, when you reserve a parking space, then you have to make sure only authorized park people park in that space. We do not have that capability uh, at this time. I don't think adding that to the definition specifies that you have to do that. It's so, simply articulating that the parking lot is also part of school grounds. Like if you look at that definition, the definition is just the definition. So we we never oppose use a parking lot. Anybody can park it. They are not, we do not deny use a parking lot. It's just that we don't have the means to stay there four, five, eight hours a day to make sure that only those people that we have reserved the space for, only those people are parking in those spaces. No one is asking you to do that. So adding, the we, par adding parking lot to the definition doesn't even do that. So uh, do I suggest adding a definition of reserving the parking lot means that it is available on first come first serve basis. Um, adding the parking lot to the dish uh, to the definition of school facilities simply means that we know that we acknowledge the parking lot is included in that and the school system can come up with a policy for allowing the community to use the parking lot. How you do that and how you facilitate that is fine as long as the community can use the parking lot. Dr. Hager. I was typing that's what I was going to say that it could be in the rule or in the application more specifics like what Mr. Dixit just said. Yeah, I mean, but we're just putting the word parking lot in a definition that lifts that lists other things in school facilities, right? So we're not actually saying a lot about the parking lot. We're just saying a school facility consists of building, grounds, blah, 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 parking lots as well. The rest of the policy in the rules can stipulate how the community can use the parking lot. So Ms. Uh, Rowe? Yes? Um, I have a question then. So if we are allowing, um, reserving the parking lot, would that permit the person or group reserving to block off parking so that they they would be responsible for enforcing it and this could be in the rule but I, I want to make sure we're clear as to what we're doing by adding parking lot to the definition we're saying that the parking lot is part of a school facility that a person theoretically could use if they have permission to use school facilities and then it's up and for the school system off. Well, that's up to the school system to figure that out in the rule because our policy doesn't clearly state every little detail about how we're going to administer these reservations. Right, and, I, and I'm not trying to get into the weeds here, but if you reserve a classroom or you reserve a space in the school, it's assumed that's going to be your space. If you reserve a parking lot, does that give the bearer of the reservation the right to cordon off or block that parking lot. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, versus I what understand what you're saying, but that's not, that's not, well, I think it's, um, that's not what adding parking lot to the definition does. And 
if a person it like so getting permission to use the parking lot and reserving the parking lot are two different things uh let's see what miss howie just put here miss becker you want to add something to this conversation please feel free to do so Yes, since I'm the one that kind of struggles with the community and the reserving of these parking lots, if we added parking lot to the definition, everything currently in the definition is reservable. You put parking lots in there, they're going to think it's a reservable. And then it's the confusion comes in is with the community, they don't understand that it's first come first serve. So putting it in there, they're going to assume that that's going to be part of the reservable space. And then they're going to con just say they're concerned if there's a huge game that day and they say, well, we got to reserve space for that, but now there's no parking spaces because there's a game, but we got a reservation. So, and then we're going to, it's going to be I a little think confusing. That if there's a, I would think that if there's a need for the school system to use their own parking space at capacity, because someone else has already reserved enough of the school that you know the school needs its own parking lot, then that would be a reason to turn down the application for a request to reserve the parking lot on a particular day. But I don't think that that means that a person can't reserve a parking lot if it's available. Sometimes we don't know it's available because of the community that's already using it as first come first serve without reservations. Well, I know it's a confusing subject. Trust me, we've been struggling with it. Mm -hmm. I trust that you'll figure out the details. Um, let's yep, uh, no problem. Uh, let's process this so that uh, we can either say yes or no. Is there any objection to adding parking lot to the definition from the committee members? I have concerns. Okay. I have concerns that. Um, based on what Ms. Becker said, that if community members assume they're going to be able to reserve it with available space, we're setting the expectation that it's dedicated space or that they're going to cordon it off and then say there is a game, then you've got community members pitted, pitted against one another for space. And I don't think we've decided on how that space is to be used. If it truly is first come first serve, then the policy needs to state that. So I think that's that's important enough to include in policy. With that so you, added, I support this. Did you have a motion that you wanted to make to say that in the policy, Ms. Hen? I mean, um, well, this, let's process this motion first about parking and the definition, and then you can make a motion to add that portion about parking. Um, is there any objection to adding parking lots to the definition? I would move to amend the motion on the floor to mm -hmm. state that parking is first come first serve. Okay, that would be not in the definition. That would be somewhere else in the policy. So let's process the definition first, and then you can make a motion about where in the policy you want that language to be. Uh, is there any objection to putting parking lots in the definition? Okay, hearing none, that amendment um, passes. Ms. Hen, do you want to make a motion about clarifying that parking is parking lots are first come first some first come in the policy somewhere? Maybe Ms. Howie has a suggestion about where that should be stated. Yes, if she does or staff have have a suggestion. I I don't have a strong preference as long as it's in there. I'll work with the um, uh, Office of Phys uh, Department of Physical facilities to find the most appropriate place. OK, is there any objection from any committee members to having the um, policy state explicitly that parking lots are on a first come first serve basis? All right, hearing none. Um, that's uh, no, Miss Rowe, I, I put a question in the chat. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see it. No, Go ahead. No worries. Um, so the are they really first come first serve because they do tow vehicles if they're there for a period of time? I, I guess I I never thought of our parking lots as first come first serve. They tow your vehicle if you leave it there overnight. Beyond that, in my neighborhood, vehicles don't get towed out of the school parking lot. Is that true, Mr. Dixit? 
Yeah, I'm not aware of any vehicle being towed unless somebody parked there for months and months. OK. All right, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. OK. Um, is there any objection to moving policy 1300 use of school facilities to the full board for approval? Oh, wait, we still have two more. I'm sorry, Ms. Howie. What's the second one? So the second one was that the committee consider including language and the policy uh, that would require a security check of the facility after each use. Is there any objection to requiring language that um, requires a security check after each use? This is Erin Hager. Yeah, didn't oh, we, I think we just discuss that. Go that ahead, Erin. No, I, I feel like we just discussed that at length and we how did, and but, they, yeah. but I'm doing this is this is called a consensus vote. So if okay. you have an objection, then we'll call roll call, which takes longer. But if no one has an objection, we'll move on. So is then there I, an I have a question about it when it's my go turn. ahead, Ms. Fazi. Well, well Dr. I think Hager, Dr. Hager was still continuing. OK, do you guys see the chat? No, I'm on by phone. I don't okay. know if Dr. Hager, but then All right, I was so, all right, so Dr. Hager, do you have a question about security checks? No, I don't. I just object. Okay. That's all. You object to the security checks? Based on our previous discussion, yes. OK, um, so we're going to we're going to do a roll call. Is there is there a motion yeah. to require security check after after um, events of public use? I can make that motion. This is Mrs. Hahn. OK, is there a second? I'll second it. Um, Ms. Pitts, could you call the roll call vote for that, please? Excuse me, Ms. Rowe, I wanted to make a comment on this issue. We do have to hard stop at 6 o'clock. I'm just going to tell everyone that. Um, yes, ma'am. We're not even through our first agenda item yet. Go ahead, Ms. Kazi. Um, so I believe the board absolutely believes in keeping our facilities safe. We also believe that it is up to the superintendent um, and the staff to administer the policy. So that would be an issue of the rule for administration to determine uh, what are the guidelines that would require a security check um, because currently we're not doing it now. Uh, so I think, um, and if we are, it's, uh, on a case by case basis. And I think that that is an administrative issue that uh, the superintendent should um, consider and incorporate in the rule so that when there is a, a specific concern um, that then that is included as well as the custodian amount that that, that is an administrative issue that um, the superintendent and and the staff make. OK, is there any other comments before we take a roll call vote? I have one, Ms. Rowe. Go ahead. Well, I wouldn't um, support the motion as worded. I would support requiring the um, the group or the group reserving the the facility to designate a security contact and to provide a security checklist for the use of that facility. I don't know if that's getting too operational, though. But I think that it would is. Be I think I would provide to provide in the rules. I think requiring a security check means that the school system can figure out what constitutes a security check. I don't know that I think the policy needs to get that detailed, other than to say the board has an expectation that there will be something in the realm of a security check. That's what this well, my motion concern, is. My concern based on the earlier discussion is the availability of resources um, to conduct this. My but concern I would, is the bomb on Pyro um, Middle School. <laughs> I would support the I would support providing guidance to those making reservations in our schools to conduct their own security check and to ask them to designate a security contact. All right. Well, I don't know that that's a policy thing. That sounds like a rule thing. Um, Let's take a roll call vote on. Let's take a roll call vote on this motion on the floor is to add language to the policy requiring a security check after 
someone besides the school system uses our facilities. Ms. Pitts, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Hassan? Yes. And Ms. Rowe? Yes. The motion does not carry. Uh, what's the third one, Ms. Howie? The third one, members of the committee, is to add on page three, line eight, um, in section G, a requirement that any damage resulting from use of a facility be reported promptly to the Office of Facilities Operations and that all damages will be paid in full by the organization that utilized the facility. Is there a motion to add this language? So, so moved, Hager. Causey. Second, Hager. Causey, second by Hager. Is there any comments or discussion? If it's possible okay. just to put it in the chat. No, Thank it's you. not possible to put it in the chat. This is an open session. Um, okay. But if you already know, if you already know how you're going to vote, let's just vote because we have to move on. Ms. Pitts, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes, the motion carries. Okay, so is there any objection now to moving policy 1300 use of school facilities forward to the full board as amended? Ms. Rowe, I have had something in the chat and I just wanna quickly- No, we don't have time. Is this about moving the policy to the full board? Yes, it is. Is it? Is it? Is it? OK, fine. Go ahead. No, you know what? Let's just leave this policy to the end. We'll come back to it because we have other people here who want to present and you can. You know, it'll just stay here for now. Um, okay. Item three. Why is will will Mr. Dixit and uh, Ms. Becker be needed at the end of the meeting? Or may they I honestly excluded? have no idea, but I have no idea how long Ms. Causey's comments and questions are going to continue to hold up this agenda item. So if if Ms. Causey could give me an idea of how long she wants to hold up this agenda item, then I could make a decision as to whether we're going to move it to the next meeting, move it to the end of this meeting, or... I'd be done by now. <laughs> I know this, but this keeps happening. It's called what, policy what review. What do you want to say? And it's in the chat. Question about the other aspect, page one, line five. Um, meetings will be open to the public. What if it is a scout group or a certain age group, sports, elementary student music, classes, uh, paid for rec classes, aerobics, yoga, art, et cetera. And then Miss Howie was kind enough to put in. Uh, 7108 of the education article, ma'am. Yes, thank you. The law. Um, and what the dis distinction is, and I just believe it was in, in, in editing, but it is important, is that on page one, uh, line 17, it says other civic educational, social or recreational purposes. So social and recreational, those are, you know, you rent the classroom for a birthday party, obviously not open to the public. Uh, you know, under a travel soccer league, obviously not open to the public. So I think it's just a matter of moving those uh, to a different location in the policy where it is not included to be open to the public. Ms. Howie, do you understand um, my concern? Sorry, I do not um, because I'm looking at the statute and the statute says these meetings shall be open to the public. Uh, what shall be open to the public is the presentation and discussion of public questions, public speaking, lectures, or other, oh, civic, educational, social, recreational purpose. How can they have that in the law? I would defer to the General Assembly. So we have discussed this, and I've, I've repeated many times that this is, for the most part, something the General Assembly is forcing us to do. It's not really something that's our choice. Well, I would just uh, suggest when the Rec and Park 
joint use is, agreement is uh, reviewed, that there'd be some language that clarifies how that's going to work. Sure. Thank you. Madam, can we move along? I'd Thank really you. love to. Um, policy 1300, use of school facilities. Is there any objection to moving this to the full board for approval as amended? Hearing none, policy 1300, use of school facilities is moved to the full board for approval. Item three, unfinished business. Policy um, 6002, selection of instructional materials. Ms. Shea, please proceed. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, members of the Policy Review Committee. Um, I am here today to bring forward our proposed changes to Policy 6002, Selection of Instructional Materials. As you know, this policy is needed by our system to make sure that we fulfill the promise outlined in our compass, which states that excellence in student achievement is grounded in effective and responsive teaching of a rigorous, inclusive curriculum aligned to standards. Um, to give a bit of background before I go into the proposed revisions, you'll see in the analysis that this has had quite a journey and we have um, been working on this policy for a number of years. What's important to note and that you'll see reflected in the policy analysis and also hopefully today in the changes I bring forward is that we also in the interim time period received feedback from two additional sources, one being the legislative audit which recommended that we um, include language about documentation regarding to the selection of instructional materials as outlined by 6002 and aligned to procurement processes. And the second is the Public Works Efficiency Review, um, which you will see we received not only a commendation, but also some recommendations, which I hope you will see reflected in the proposed changes as well. Um, so given that background, I would like to, and in the interest of time, jump right into sharing the proposed changes and then certainly welcome any um, questions or comments. Um, you'll see reflected, we did include a definition of instruction and materials. We did also include um, policy statements referencing the legal authority of the board. Then we did include specific language to ensure that we're referencing educational equity. Um, including language from state regulations regarding educational equity, and we also included the legal references. In paragraph 3E, we also state in our response to that legislative audit that I mentioned, as well as the um, Public Works Efficiency Review, that prior to any contract renewal or modification, we will evaluate the effectiveness of the instructional materials and communicate the results of that evaluation to the board. We also, as part of our feedback, have included a hyperlink to connect the superintendent's rule to the policy language. And then in paragraph 3A, we have included language regarding the purchase of complete curriculum where practicable. Um, this is re in regards to the Public Works Efficiency Review recommendation about the impact of writing curriculum and the expense and positions used to develop internal curriculum. And the reason we included the language where practicable is that, of course, um, not every course that we offer in BCPS um, is that possible. So there are some instances where we are creating, uh, for example, uh, just right now we're working on an exciting innovation in CTE with artificial intelligence. Um, and because that is so new, we are working collaboratively, but it's not necessarily something that we can purchase um, as a whole just yet. And um, then we also did include language regarding um, accessibility. Um, part of the definition of instructional materials does include both print and digital. And since we are expanding the definition to include digital, it's critically important that we include language regarding uh, COPPA or the Children's Online Privacy Act, as well as FERPA, um, and our WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines to make sure that we are meeting those expectations as well. Um, and then finally, um, as I mentioned before, in that initial audit, which sent us back to PRC back in um, 2021, we did include um, language to establish guidelines regarding the documentation of the evaluation of instructional materials selected under this policy. Hopefully I can make up some time for you, Ms. Rowe, but with that, um, those are the proposed changes to the policy and I welcome any questions from the committee. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Uh, committee members, are there any questions? Okay, hearing none, is there any Ms. objection? Pro. Sorry, yes. I was on mute. 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Has, has there been an updated um, list of changes that was not updated to board docs? Because I'm not seeing all of the items that Ms. Shea listed in our version of the exhibit. Do we have the latest? You do. Okay. Was that was that it, Ms. Hen? I was looking for the the detailed um, changes regarding the privacy, digital privacy. In three C. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Shea, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's in um, Section 3C, where you'll see Ms. Hen, um, Superintendent shall establish guidelines that are compliant with federal, state, local laws regarding data privacy and copyright accessibility for students. So while she referenced um, COPA and FERPA, uh, that's mm -hmm. not, it, that's all part of the data privacy. And in Result. the policy analysis, we referenced those in the legal requirements used to inform that language addition. Okay, and and I had asked the superintendent about this, but um, we we had quite an excellent um, site off of our own bcps.org that had information about digital privacy up to supplemented this policy nicely. Would would you happen to know the status of that as it relates to um, this recommendation? If that's still a resource, and should that resource, if it still exists, um, should it be referenced? in this policy? So I, I don't know if that question is for me or Dr. McComas. Dr. McComas, do you want me to answer? Uh, so I, I would say first we, um, as you know, our communications team is in the process of updating our website. Um, and so where they are with the particular migration of that in this moment in time, I don't have my finger on, but perhaps Mache, if you uh, have something to add, I do know that that is part of what used to be part of our website. And so we're looking to migrate all of that critical information over. I just don't have the work plan for that particular item, Ms. Hen. Michelle, do you have anything? I don't know if you have anything. Okay, exactly. you have nothing to add. Because it, it detailed the data um, that's captured by um, the software and anyway, sorry. Um, so a reference to that would, would make sense within this policy. But that that content is is no longer online. So if you knew of the plans to migrate it to the current website or where it exists, if it's coming back in a different format, that would be helpful to know because I'd like to include a reference to that within this policy. And it ties in nicely with this update. Sure. Um, I, I can also offer um, part of the reason Dr. McComas and I don't have that timeline is because that um, was one office that was moved in the reorganization in March. So the office that oversees the data privacy uh, is no longer in CNI, but we can certainly take that back to find out a timeline of when that information would be updated. Okay, so this recommendation stems from, from where? This was from a public works recommendation or from another which, office? Which recommendation? I'm talking about the, the information you referenced where we kept a database of no. what software um, shared each data point. That's what I was referencing. No, the privacy laws and regulations. Oh, that we included because there is actually a legal requirement for us to include that in selection of any digital materials. That was not in the public works audit. What was in the public works audit was the reorganization. So that site would be, sorry, um, he has a lot to say about this. Um, that would be very helpful to, it would, it would be helpful to accompany that, that legal requirement to include that in the policy. It would be helpful to include that website. That's all I had, Ms. Rowe, thank you. Okay, are there any other comments or questions on this agenda item? Yes, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to understand, uh, I don't see any statement that uh, in this policy about being compliant with state procurement law, and I do not see a legal reference to state procurement in the uh, legal references section either. Um, 
And I also want it to understand where is the procedure or the superintendent's rule for um, piloting instructional materials? Because I'm curious if there should be some uh, comment so, about that in this policy. So there's a couple of things what you said. First, the language that the purchasing office added is in 3A. Um, and it references being consistent with the standards of quality um, to ensure that, and that's where there's that reference to the language about it being complete. And then there is also um, in section E about the uh, contract renewal or contract modification that there will be the guidelines for evaluating it. Um, and then the reference is to the board policy 3209, the purchasing principles and 3210, the purchasing guidelines. So. Um, that's the reference that we made to the procurement policies internally. Um, in terms of the um, curriculum, so that is actually a part of um, policy in Rule 6000. Um, this 6002 is specifically about the selection of instructional materials, whereas policy in Rule 6000 speaks to the development of curriculum, which includes language regarding pilots. Okay, thank you for that, but don't we pilot instructional materials or no? So when we purchase instructional materials um, as complete curriculum, then policy in rule 6000 would apply because so for in recent example, things like open court and bridges, while there is a procurement about how we purchase it, we're purchasing it as curriculum. So then both policies are enacted, which is where the pilot comes in. The distinction would be, is it the curriculum in its entirety, Ms. Posse, or is it a resource that we're using to support um, the curriculum? As you know, we have um, a tradition of um, teacher developed curriculum where we buy resources to support uh, that. So that would be the distinction. OK, and so piloted is the curriculum. OK, and so. I guess I'm curious about that, and, and I'm not going to make any, any amendments to this today, um, but I think that's something to consider given don't we have incredibly large contracts for instructional materials? And we do I, have some, in which case then they are considered curriculum. And they are, so I guess what I'm offering is that um, when you purchase an instructional material, especially when there's a large contract, there would be an, uh, that would necessitate a change in curriculum. Either we're purchasing an entire curriculum, which is what the efficiency reviews we try to do wherever practicable, or we purchased an instructional material and had to internally make the changes as in the example of the artificial intelligence curriculum. Once we make any changes or updates to curriculum based on the purchase of an instruction material, we have to pilot that new curriculum. But we're not piloting the individual resource, we're piloting the curriculum that has been changed with the purchase of a resource. Okay, thank you. And so you you said in terms of the procurement, the other policy um, related to procurement has the being compliant with federal, state, and local laws. Correct. 3209 and 3210. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are there any more comments or questions on policy 6002? Hearing none, is there any objection to moving policy 6002 as amended to the full board for approval? Mr. Why object? I think this okay. policy is still particularly around digital privacy. Does the rest of the committee feel the same way? Well, um, I defer to Ms. Hen on issues of student digital privacy. Um, there, but I will say on page two, um, Paragraph C, it says the superintendent shall establish guidelines that are compliant with federal, state, and local laws regarding data privacy and copyright accessibility for students. So, Ms. Hen, are we, is Baltimore County um, doing something more stringent? Thank, thank you for that question, Mrs. Causey. Um, we were leaders in this area, and my concern is that with the restructuring, reorganization, as well as the um, lapse of information available to our families. My concern is that we are taking less stringent um, actions around student data privacy. And 
relying on the superintendent um, while well-intentioned to develop those guidelines, I think there are experts that we should be reliant on instead and should be following industry best practices. So I would like to see stronger language here um, that we will be following industry best practices um, and purchasing materials that are um, compliant with industry best practices to protect our students' um, PII. Go ahead, yeah. Shay. May I clarify something? Yes, go ahead. So I do want to um, share two things. One is that there have been no changes to the student data privacy agreement that is required to be signed for any purchase of materials. So while I appreciate Ms. Hen's question about what has or has not been restored on the website, and, and I, um, of course, will take that back, I do want to assure the committee the, the leadership that we established as a system in having an incredibly stringent student data privacy agreement is still in place um, and is still a part of the work that we do with any instructional materials because my team is intimately involved with negotiating that and I can agree with you that ours is incredibly um, stringent. And then second, I did want to reference that within the rule language um, in section five, we did include that instructional materials um, compliance with federal, state, and local laws regarding data privacy, copyright, and accessibility as part of the evaluation criteria. Um, so that language is included in the rule. Thank you, Ms. Shea. I appreciate that, Ms. Shea. Thank you. However, there's more that can be done that is not required by law. And you're absolutely right. I'm very proud of the actions that BCPS has taken. Um, we've been a leader with regards to student data privacy. And the website that I mentioned should have been one of the first ones restored when we brought our website back up. I've asked repeatedly the status and have gotten no response. And the fact that we no longer have dedicated resources to this um, is concerning to me. So now that we have an opportunity to update this policy, we need to be taking more than the minimum required um, actions by law to protect our students' data privacy. So I would recommend to the committee that we update this language to include that we will be following industry best practices. And I, I'd be open to suggestions from staff, but we need to be doing more. And we have done more. I think that needs to be um, still in place. It sounds like it is, which is great. Then let's have our policy reflect what we are doing. Thank Ms. you. Ms. do you have a motion on sending this policy back to staff to make language suggestions on strengthening the privacy requirements around possibly some specific authorities best practices because I feel like saying best practices is very non-specific and what you're suggesting maybe needs staff to review this more and if if we're going to do that the committee needs to vote on that so did you want to make a motion to that effect Ms. Han Ms. Rowe Yes. I was typing something in the chat. Uh, it's still alone. typing. Out. Sorry, I was just. But Ms. Hen, did you want? Did you hear what I said? I was. No, I'm sorry. I was disconnected. Okay. What I said was, uh, did you want to make a motion, sending this back to staff to research and propose language strengthening our privacy um, requirements because stating best practices does not state whose best practices or what the agency producing those guidelines is, or it's very nonspecific. So did you want to make a sure. motion suggesting that staff research this? I would like to make a motion with alternative language. If we could um, return to this policy and move on with the agenda, I will formulate that motion if that's okay, Madam Chair. That's fine, um, providing we get to the rest of this before six o'clock. Um, all right, so we will. Um, Sally's going to correct me. Postpone, table. What's the word for leaving it to the end of the meeting? You're postponing. Okay, so we're going to postpone um, item three to the end of the meeting, or at least till we finish some of these other things. I apologize, Ms. Shea and uh, Dr. McComas, but I think I would like you to stay in case that language needs to be addressed. Sure, um, we're here to the end. Okay. Item four, policy 3410, transportation services. Dr. Grimm, please proceed.
Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jess Grimm, Manager of Business Operations, and the recommendation for the proposed changes to 3410 come from feedback gathered in the spring of 2022 mainly. Um, this feedback it notes that eligible students in the Baltimore County Public Schools um, through 3410 would change uh, the size of the walk zone and also this would be in alignment with the Public Works Recommendation 6.14. So the policy presented for the committee's consideration contains the following revisions to replace references to walking with non-transported zone, and that is directly in response to Public Works Recommendation 6-14. It also inserts language to increase the non-transported zone by one quarter of a mile for middle school and high school students, from one mile to one and a quarter mile for middle schoolers, and from one and a half miles to one and three quarter mile for high school students. The fiscal impact is yet to be determined by the revisions of this policy. However, based on data from June of 2022, approximately uh, 2,500 middle school students would be added to the non-transported zone, to totaling over 7,500, and approximately 5,000 high school students would be added to the non-transported zone, totaling over 13,000 students. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. Dr. Hager, you have a question? Yes, um, I remember discussing this and I think it, you know, it's one of the solutions that we came up with to resolve some of the transportation issues. Um, and so I definitely support it. I just, I thought that we had already started these uh, different zones starting this year. Is that true? So what the Office of Transportation has actually done is to take a look at some of the areas where we where we've said students are should not be transported by policy and we've examined why the, the policy also reads that the Office of Transportation it currently reads and it would continue to read that if for some reason the Office of Transportation deems uh, there to be some kind of a safety obstruction that service could be provided in those cases. So, um, for example, right now it, it it is it is purely around walking. This would change the language, obviously, to be non-transported, which does have a, a different nuance to it. But let's say the pathway is over a, a main artery from the child to child's home or the area of residence to the school. The Office of Transportation may deem that a safety issue and continue to provide transportation. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great, but but we already extended the zones to the one and three quarters starting this beginning of the school year. Is that right or no? No, ma'am, we have we have not because of oh, okay. because of policy. There okay. was a discussion that was made that would that had that occurred last spring, but yes, no, we, yeah. we can't do that. And actually, this would not go into effect until uh, July 1st of, of 2023 so that the Office of Transportation could prepare and inform parents for next school year. That was going to be my next question. Thank you very much. This is You're great. You're welcome. Are there any questions, committee members? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Cause. I have a question. Go ahead, and then Julie, you're next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, I, Council District 3, which I represent, uh, includes 200 square miles of the county known as the Hereford Zone, uh, where there are almost no sidewalks, curvy, narrow roads. Um, and I see that uh, the policy talks about um, develop guidelines, you know, when there's uh, conditions between the non-transported zone and school are unsafe and transportation is required. Um, so is the unsafe conditions, are those outlined in the rule and how um, specifically are areas with non-sidewalks or uh, you know, rural winding roads addressed. So I'm actually, I'll answer your your question in two parts. So the, the first is that sidewalks actually are, are not a metric that are, that are an absolute for um, the Office of Transportation. So if you look at some of the, the very well-established roadways in, in areas throughout Baltimore County, for example, um, in, in more what I would call urban areas in Baltimore County, there's actually some that do not have a network of sidewalks or the, or the sidewalks are not contiguous. Um, so that, that could be construed as a barrier. What the Office of Transportation actually does is they conduct an on-site, um, they, they conduct, conduct an on-site visit of the roadway. So a residential roadway of 25 miles an hour or less 
um, that has an adequate adequate space and an adequate walking path is is actually deemed um, safe for, for students to walk, depending on the amount of traffic, if it's a, a through street, if it's a contained street. So those types of parameters are actually within the Office of Transportation's operating procedures, and they're not specifically outlined in um, policy or the superintendent's rule because they are they are very detailed and they can change whether through Comar or through best safety practices. Um, so that's one thing on, on the sidewalks piece where where you're talking about in, in areas of District 3, Ms. Causey, um, we have, for example, established some uh, uh, bus stops and that's that's policy in Rule 3410 or 3420, excuse me, um, because the line of sight is is unsafe for a uh, another uh, vehicle on the road to see the bus and to be able to stop in time. So um, the Office of Transportation takes very seriously uh, it, both the, the non-transported zone and where bus stops are established and the, the routes that we take. Um, Baltimore County is still the, it's the only district in the state that requires same side service, for example, where, um, where many other districts allowed to cross on the lights. We do, we do have a, a system up in, again, in your area, because it is rural, where we can make an exception to that um, if it is, if it is safe, if it is deemed safe to do so. So I think there's a lot of nuances and, and I can't answer your question with just one blanket statement and I hope that's satisfactory. That is very satisfactory. Thank you very much for that. And um, the other question I had is related to the transportation consultant that is um, currently assisting um, our transportation department. Um, are they then going to be engaged in how this impacts new routes? So I think that's a great question because that that's exciting news. Well, so there will be there will be a number of different different models that the Office of Transportation works through as they as they change the the non transported zone um, or alter what are the current walk zones for the schools. And again, so that's that's only one component of this because what we see in the software um, in, in terms of where students are transported is only one part of the, the reality. It's those on-site visits, it's knowing the roadways that is more important. To answer your question, actually both consultants that we're working with will hopefully be part of this project moving forward because they have lots of experience in working with um, students who are, are not transported and working with uh, software to make sure that we're leveraging the technology that we have um, to most appropriately serve students. Thank you. Welcome. Ms. Hen. Thanks, Ms. Rowe. Hi, Dr. Graham. Thanks for joining us this evening. I appreciate your time. Um, so it looks like uh, 7,500 students will um, move into this non-transported category. Is that correct? So I believe that the 7500 would be for the would be for the middle school would be for the middle school students that would be a total and it would be um, a total of 13,000 so yes it would be an additional 7500 students. Total 7500 total right middle and Ad high additional students that's correct. Cor correct additional which is in effect close to 10% reduction in in student ridership. Give or take, we, if we transport seventy-seven thousand, give or take, potentially. So, so what what we don't know, and this is part of the modeling that we do, and the reason why the Office of Transportation could not put a fiscal impact. Um, what is un, what the unknown variable is at that time at this time is how many of the students that fall within the non-transported zone cur currently do not access um, mm -hmm. school bus transportation. Okay. So and and to the and to answer the previous questions and just to kind of go back to the previous yeah. questions, there will be some uh, schools and some non-transported areas that the school system deems we we should transport because there is a safety or an or another concern. School construction is also a big one. When we have school construction, there are sometimes students that are typically ineligible to ride that the Office of Transportation needs to needs to 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 transport. Sure. Um, and sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. You answered one of my questions or started to go down the path of what my one question, which was whether or not this data was based on the surveys that we um, 
the surveying we did at the beginning of the year. It is of not, actual ridership of the Northeast ridership of no the Northeast that ridership. That, that's right. It was only the Northeast. Okay. No, it, this it is based not. on this is based on our looking at the information that we get out of student addresses from Focus, cross matching it with the the data and the tools that we have available in the in the routing software and um, forecasting moving forward. Okay, thank you. And then um, going back to the ten percent, what? what concern I have, and it sounds like um, the analysis isn't quite complete to answer this question, would be the impact on staff if we are looking at um, any changes in our current staffing level or contracted service levels, or is that remaining constant? And this change would be just to improve our overall service that we're able to do more with what we have. So I think I think that is an unknown. Uh, I don't know that the Office of Transportation foresees any significant change that would uh, affect staffing in, in any way, shape or form. Um, mm -hmm. If anything, it, it could impact some of our contracted routes because we can move service around and we could sure. certainly move some of the, the service that we have to shore up some other areas. Right, but we're not looking to eliminate any contractors or no, eliminate any staff positions. Awesome. OK, no, last question before Ms. Rowe yells at me, um, and then that is the um, impact on schools with um, car riders. Um, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about, again, our middle and highs that aren't designed to support the volumes of car traffic that we're seeing. And have you looked at that or analyzed the impact of this change on those schools? And, no. and absorbing that additional car traffic? No, that's that that's a very good question. And again, I, I, I think that the Office of Transportation would tell you it's really a variable which would be incredibly difficult to predict based on the fact of, of um, the, the students and, and particularly at the high school level that may ride in one season, ride the bus in one season, maybe transported by car in another season. When the weather's good, even though that they live a little further away, they might walk now. Um, I think there's lots of, of variables to that and it really will range from school to school uh, regarding the infrastructure that's available um, to accommodate those. We saw a huge uptick in, in uh, uh, v, uh, car traffic during the pandemic. So I think that that, that could be an indicator and a, and a point of, of learning moving forward as well. Right, and, and we would hope that any uptick would be offset by um, an increase in ridership in other areas, right? That it would balance out um, because with the improvements in reliability and efficiency and 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 the department's doing a great job. I've I've gotten so many compliments recently about the improvements and and see this as only continuing that that trend. So um I will be supporting this for that reason. I just it these are some things to keep an eye on um pr at particular schools and I I know the team knows which schools those are um where the over you know they're they're bursting at the seams based on the infrastructure needs and and can't support the volumes of car traffic we have now. So um, I would hope that we would just keep an eye on them and make adjustments as needed. It sounds like this, um, we have some flexibility here that if we start to see a school really running into some safety issues that that we can adjust as needed. Is that an accurate statement? That's, that's just, that is that is current practice now, that is correct. Terrific, thank you, Ms. Rowe, that's all. Yes, Ms. Hang, I had already discussed um, postponing um, 5550 and 5560 with Ms. Howie, but also as we have to end this meeting very quickly, let's finish this agenda item, policy 3410, transportation services. Is there any objection to moving policy 3410 to the full board for approval? Hearing none, policy 3410 is moved to the full board for approval. Um, this meeting has to end at six. And I don't see us doing um, very much more in four minutes. So I'm going to move to item six and we'll adjourn the meeting and then you'll see those other two items on the next agenda. Um, Ms. Howie is gonna talk to Tracy and find out if there's a way to have another meeting uh, before the end of my term for PRC so we can finish those two things. But if not, it will carry on to the next PRC. Um, so, the next meeting of the policy review committee 
It's scheduled for Monday, February 6, 2023 at 4.30 p.m. Unless um, you all get an email that that's different. Because there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Have a good evening.